I'm glad you're here. A lot of love. And that it's not too hot. It's pretty good. Um, I'm going to, we have some visuals that we'll show you as well. And, oh, 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 Jesus Christ. We're going to try to keep Gary from falling out the window. Sorry about that. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. And we were so nervous about it being really hot up here that we kind of over fanned. Yeah. 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 Um, anyway, it's a real thrill to be here and to be able to launch this book in this room. Um, none of these texts have been brought into English before, so it's kind of a magic night in a, in a historically magical room. Um, I will talk um, about, I'll give a, some biographical information about Michelle. And I thought that it might be possible that a lot of people were not as familiar with familiar with his visual work as they were with his writing. So I'm going to we'll show some a very kind of thumbnail sketch of um, the trajectory of his visual um, work as well. Um, all three of these books were written in the mid to late century, from 1956 to 1959. They're all considered mescaline texts, written, uh, written during his mescaline period. Am I too loud? Is everything okay? Um, which was an 11-year experiment with mescaline. Um, so I'll talk briefly about Michaud's uh, biography. The writing preceded the visual work by only two years. It's in 1922, at the age of 23, that Michaud begins to write. And in 1924, <coughs> excuse me, he begins to paint and draw and continues both of these activities concurrently throughout his entire life until he dies at the age of 85 in 1984. Belgian-born Henri Michaud, 1899-1984, was one of the most influential French writers and painters of the 20th century. He published over 30 books of poems, narratives, essays, travelogues, journals, and drawings. His visual work was shown in major museums of Europe and the U.S., including the Guggenheim in New York and the Museum of Modern Art in Paris. And today, his visual work is collected all over the globe. Working as both a writer and visual artist throughout the 60 years of his prodigious creative life, Michaud explored the darker, shadowy realms of human consciousness while concurrently searching for an adequate tool or medium of expression, whether it be language, drawing, paint, that was up to the difficulty of his task. <clears throat> and throughout his work, one can trace a desire for and his disappointment in not finding a universal language through gesture, mark, sign, and the word. That's what he's always after, and that's what he always doesn't get. So it's sort of a beautiful failure. Um, and it's in these three books that we see these dual occupations of the visual and the verbal come together in ways that um, are, you don't see anywhere else with this entire, within his entire book. Um, so, um, his work follows an inquiry that I think is really remarkable in its singularity. He was firm in his belief that there is no self there aren't two, this is a direct quote from him, there is no self, there aren't two selves, there aren't ten selves, there is no self. So you can get over it. But what there was for Michel was consciousness and perception and being. And it's the, it's the accelerations and pauses and squalls and shocks of uh, the fluctuations of being that... Uh, come through so clearly in both his visual work and his, 
his writing. Difficult to classify, fiercely independent, a very private man. He was often linked to the surrealist, surrealists, an identification that he eschewed. But we shouldn't make too much of him eschewing surrealism because we show eschewed just about everything. And we already have a slide of a picture of him at about the age of 25, um, which would have been taken in 1924 when he arrived in Paris. Um, it's interesting to note that he arrives in Paris right at the same time that André Breton's first Surrealist Manifesto appears. Um, so he's right there at this extremely interesting, exciting time in literary history. Uh, as I said before, he was not French, but Belgian-born, a child of the middle classes. His mother was a Walloon, meaning she came from the predominantly French-speaking southern region of Belgium. His father was a lawyer from the Ardennes a region of extensive forests beginning in southeast Belgium and Luxembourg. Michaud's grandfather was German, and there's also Spanish, distant Spanish ancestry in his lineage. By all accounts, he was a sickly child, usually at odds with his parents. At age six, he was sent to the country to be educated at Pute Grasada in Antwerp where all his classes were taught in Flemish. And at age 12, he was sent to a Jesuit school in um, Brussels, where his classes were taught in French, and he began to write in French. It was another grim boarding school that Michel described as being poor, tough, cold school. He was so private, one of the most um, comprehensive biographical text that you can find about Michel was a, a poem that he wrote um, I think it's 15, 57 years of existence someone asked him for a, a biography and he turned it into a poem and it's got the dates and the... <coughs> okay so his time at the Jesuit boarding school of cars during World War One including the German occupation of Brussels from 1914 to 1918. And due to the occupation, um, sometimes the, the whole school would be shut down, except for the library. And it was here, as an adolescent, that Henri Michaud first reads the Christian mystics, who were to become extremely important to him. Um, he immersed himself in Ernest Hello. John Roosbrook, and Blaise Pascal. Years later, when writing, his friend and critic Jean Paulin, referring in particular to one of the texts we have here, 400 Men on the Cross, Michaud said, quote, I love, without restriction nor explanation, L'Autrement and Ernest Hella. In all honesty, Christ as well. <laughs> As a young man, Michaud very ardently wanted to join the priesthood, but was dissuaded from doing so by his father, who was a Catholic lawyer who preferred that his son become a doctor. So in 1919, he begins medical studies at Brussels University, experiences a religious crisis, which we will soon learn more about in 400 Men on the Cross, and eventually rebels against his parents' wishes. He drops out travels North and South America as a ship stoker in the French merchant marines. In 1922, he returns to Brussels, reads La Tremance, the Chance de Maldorar, and begins to write. In 1924, he moves to Paris, never to return to Belgium again, and supports himself by working as a teacher and a secretary, and begins to both paint and write concurrently. He becomes interested in works of Paul Clay, Max Ernst, de Chirico, and Dali. As you'll soon see, we're going to show you some of his visual work. Um, the, the, both the verbal and the visual work are marked by a sense of fluidity and movement, a boundarylessness. He made very little difference between the external and the interior machinations of, of experience. 
Um, he viewed the self as an impediment, the world an apparition, language marks, drawings, paintings were all failures and with agendas of their own. Only the unknown and within the unknown, only the uncontrollable was to be trusted. So let's show, Chris, there you are, his first um, <coughs> visual piece what is was called Alphabet 1925 and you can see right away this preoccupation he has with um, trying to create a, a new language is right there. Is it writing? You as a viewer or as a reader are asked to consider is it writing or is it drawing? Um, got a western modality of, of reading from left to right in lines. Um, some of the figures look like alphabetic letters, but they're not quite alphabetic letters. Some of them also, like right in the middle there, look like human figures, and yet they aren't. And then you've got the sense of, of making paragraphs as well. Art critic and poet Barry Schwabsky, writing in art form, describes this work as suggestive of text, quote, handwritten in characters that only appear once if such a thing were possible. So from the very outset of his creative life, we see Michaud trying to draw a new language. Um, and it's interesting to jump back from this point to his feelings about surrealism because <clears throat> he never embraced um, surrealist, surrealism fully, and nor did he become a, a card-carrying um, surrealist. He had issues with automatic writing. Um, he didn't believe that the human hand was fast enough to record human thought using the alphabet. And, you know, this is sort of a proof of that because it's, you know, you just get the jet. Maybe this would get close to that. He also believed that language was too slow of a construct, that thinking was much faster than language. And so language would always intrude, therefore there would be no automatism. Schwabsky explains, Michaud's draftsmanship was born out of an urge to depict the strangeness of writing, to produce something even more opaque than the invented words in his poems of the period, just as those words amplify the vivifying effect he had found as a child of isolated words in the dictionary, where, this is a quote directly from Michaud, where words do not yet belong to phrases, to phrase makers. So Chris, if you would show us the next slide. This is um, from an, uh, one of his earliest books titled Who I Was. And uh, at the, when, he, when he first starts to write, he he's works with invented, inventing language, which he quickly discards and begins to write in the most transparent way possible. But it's interesting to, to look at this. I'll just read. Um, he grabber routes him and grabbits him to the ground. He rads him and rabbits him to his drat. He brattles him and lippics him and prooks his bottles. He tackrads him and marmeans him. He mandles him rasp by rasp and rasp by rasp. And he disskinabilizes him at the end. <laughs> so... Um, one of the things that's interesting is while he drops, you know, this invention of words, uh, you know, as much as he's, as he's got at the very beginning, it is something that he returns to um, in almost all of his books. Uh, the while there predominantly is a sense of language being completely transparent, it's like reading the telephone book or an instruction manual there will still on occasion be an invented word here or there. And also in, uh, uh, in Peace in the Breaking, uh, one of the books here, collected here, uh, the, the poems will break down just into pure sound on occasion too. Okay, so uh, I think we can go to the next slide. This is... Um, the first one-man show of Henri Michaud in Paris, 1937, Prince of Night, Wash on Black. 
you can probably quite easily make out that red face at the top there and a little crown and probably a mask to the right. I don't know if you can see, but if you look really closely, the whole corpus here is constructed of faces that are trying to come forward um, out of the surface uh, towards you. Um, Michelle was very um, obsessed with drawing and painting and representing the human face. Um, just mainly, he was so distrustful of the notion of self that the, and the face as a representation of self also became something to mistrust. So that becomes one of the, the obsessions that you see in the visual art. Um, and we can go to the next slide too. This is um, 1945, made during the German occupation of Paris. Michaud was occupied by the Germans twice in his life. Um, this is frottage, a mixture of, of crayon and frottage. Frottage, as I'm sure many of you know, is when you lay a piece of paper over a solid object and rub it with drawing or charcoal. Michel really loved working in this way as a visual artist. He thought that the lost ghost, you know, that being and consciousness might arise in that way by using that particular technique. Okay, we can go to the next slide. This is one of my favorite pieces of Michel's, Untitled 1947. Um, I think it's done in charcoal. Remind that we don't see his signature in this one. Remind me to talk about his signature when we go to the next one. Let's look to the next. Do you see in the far where? Yeah, on the far left, the little the, it, it's a little H and M, and that's Michaud's signature. And it becomes this kind of icon in and in and of itself. This little you know visual verbal stamp of Michel. This is also frottage and crayon. And we can move to the next one. This is Untitled, 1946, Watercolor and Ink on Paper, 12 and a half by 9. He, off, he, he worked pretty small. Um, very often, you know, the size of a piece of paper that you would write on. Um, doesn't get too much larger than that. And you can Notice the the way the sense of a face coming forward towards you out of a out of a weltering sort of chaos. Um, an art critic, Peter Schadl, uh, said that he thought he was the that Michel was the master of equivocation. Okay, so let's move on to the next one, untitled 1953. I wanted to show you this one because it's in color. He did work in color, some, not tremendously a whole lot, but some. This, um, depending upon how you look at it, is a human face. Also, there's a duality of two figures. Um, this is Frittage and uh, Crayon and India Inc. And the next slide. This is where things turn back into the, the alphabet. And we get, uh, Michaud becomes very interested in the Chinese ideogram. You've got the, you know, the system of writing and, you know, are you, is, is he drawing, is he writing, are we reading, are we seeing that whole netherworld that he puts us in and how it moves from left to right and are these alphabetic letters or are they human figures? Um, Facing the Locks, 1951, 1967. And the next slide is Movements, 1951. This was a book that he published with, it had 64 drawings and a 15 page poem. And the um, figures become more blot like, more, more ink blot like in this period. And then the next slide, uh, 1960s, the the, some of the, you know, again you've got that left to right movement and the, some of the figures seem to be in closer dialogue with one another than in some of the previous slides that we've seen. 
and the next one, 1960s again. Um, in this one, I think you've got that sense of, of a more of a fierce movement from the left to the right hand side that is a little closer to to reading. Okay, so let's go. Uh, India 8, 1960s. This one starts to look a little more action painting like. You can see a little Pollock influence maybe. And now we're going to move to 1981. This is, remember Michaud dies in 84, so this is late in his life. And it's, um, he starts to use a lot more color in this time period. Um, it, this is ink, oil, acrylics, and of course it's another um, tortured human face. <laughs> okay, so now I thought it would be interesting if Chris could take us back to facing the locks right here and then flip all the way back up to alphabet. And you see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that singularity of vision of, of wanting to create a new uh, language that was somewhere between writing and and drawing. Um, okay, I think that just is. It's like you know, all the way through the work of 60 years of his creative life. Okay, so now we can just sort of stop all of this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, on the verbal side, as in all of his works, in these three books we find Michaud seeking to wrestle himself from the familiarity of his own consciousness through an adopted experience. Travel, mescaline, journeys into imagined world of creatures or beasts, Western or Eastern spirituality. And these ventures into consciousness are relentlessly explored from his first book to his last. And I won't list all of those. It will take too long. There are over 30. So we'll go back to the mid-1950s with Michaud about to begin another journey into consciousness, this time with Mescon. In all of his work, one becomes aware of a split in consciousness. While there's a mind at play, courting chaos, there is a mind acutely observant and vigilant, taking note of every synapse, every glimmer of the unknown. As much as Michel is desirous of vision, he is desirous to chart the course. While the work is strange, dark, and fantastic, his stance is often scientific, rational, that of one who is taking account, detached. So Michaud, who once attended medical school, is both poetic and scientific at the same time. <clears throat> Taking Rimbaud's statement, quote, contemporary poetry can no longer content itself with vague lyricism, but only with total self-knowledge, quite seriously. So always with Michaud, you got this sense of, a, of the rational mind here very acutely observing the irrational, or the conscious mind observing the unconscious mind. He wanted them both at the same time. So he become, he's, he's a paradox. He's a, a, a rational mystic. Um, so he begins to experiment with masculine around 1954-55 when a neurologist friend of his encouraged him to try the drug which he was apparently um, hesitant to try at first. Michaud was a, a, a teetotaler, but rarely drank. You know, was, um, he was far from an addict. Over the 11-year experiment, he took mescaline only a handful of times. He was drawn to the drug for its capacity to enhance a more precise division in consciousness that he was already experiencing in his art, a state in which one part of the brain remains unillusioned and lucid during vision, fantasy, or hallucination. Um, because this is apparently one of the properties of mescaline that one has, explores one's brain and watches oneself explore one's brain, so it's very appealing to Michel because he was already doing this. 
Michaud himself has often been referred to as a substance. John Ashbery, in a preface to a 1961 interview he conducted with Michaud in Michaud's apartment in Paris, described him as, quote, hardly a painter, hardly even a writer, but a conscience, the most sensitive substance yet discovered for registering the fluctuating anguish of day-to-day, minute-to-minute living. And Octavio Paz, who is a friend of Michaud's, uh, in an introduction to one of the masculine texts, wrote, When I had read the last page, I asked myself whether the result of the experiment had not been precisely the opposite. The poet Michaud, explored by mescaline. So it's precisely this dynamic moment of his visual work coming into his writing and the writing entering the visual work, not of, not of them being separate things, that we find these three mid-century books. So the next slide we can show you. This is the original um, French book, Quoi, 400 Men on the Cross. It was uh, printed in 260 copies by the great French um, printer and bookmaker Pierre Betancourt. It was seven inches by eight inches where the dimensions almost a perfect square. I think it's, for me, it's Michel's most haunting and enigmatic book. It's very ghostly. Um, I can, it was the first of the three books I translated and I can attest to Ashbery's comment about Michaud being very much like a substance. There were times I felt so nauseous I had to stop and come back to it. Um, this book appeared in 1956 between the, between the first two masculine books, Miserable Miracle and Turbulent Infinity. However, it's unknown as to whether it was written before both of these books because apparently Betancourt took a very long time to actually produce the book. Um, in this book, Michaud grapples with his lost faith by trying to write and draw the crucified Christ, the model through which the self can only conform, bound to failure. And so in this book, writing and drawing for Henri Michaud become a substitute for belief. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, 400 Men on the Cross is the only book in which we see Michel shaping poems into object-like figures, creating a simultaneous rather than complementary visual and verbal experience. There are three um, pen and ink drawings of the crucified Christ. This is one of them. You see the crown of thorns. This is the title page. I don't know if you can make it out from where you're sitting, but... On the show is the credit that is the crown there a little bit, and then you've got Katsin and the 1956. And let's go to the next um, slide. This I can read you the translation. Um, I right at the very top. I cannot always place the cross first. Sometimes it's the man who must be stretched out before everything else, stretched out in the middle of the sky, stretched and stretched, the way human suffering stretches. Okay, we can go to the next slide. There's another um, cross, pen and ink drawing by Michaud, and you, you see the little H&M there, which is uh, very easy to miss. Um, okay, I'm going to move forward. This is where you start to see um, the actual you know, shaping of the coins um, into parts of the cross. If we go to the next slide, we can. This is the um, translation. There, there aren't 400 men on the cross. There are. He, he randomly picks numbers and then, you know, has gaps and. Um, this is number 97. Curious devotion. The cross was in danger of falling apart. Seemed certain to let go. Without his arms, which in a crazy idea of sacrifice, or by a reflex misplaced, 
Help firm the rotten wood and save the cross and the ceremony and the Holocaust, thereby answering materially what was expected of him. And then in this next one, number 99, you've got this smaller text inside the cross. And so you have, you have the Christ figure hiding inside of the actual wooden cross. Not on, but in the cross, inside whose bars he allows himself to be observed as though in a prison cell, indifferent in one way, torn apart in another. Fat the cross is, paunchy, as if to so many future crosses it was giving birth. And then you've got the little text on the inside of Christ. He is inside, at the very bottom, small, shrunken, disclaimed, erased, almost imperceptible. Okay, so can we go to... And here's another of the um, pen and ink drawings of the crucif crucifixion. And uh, uh, one of the things that for me was so interesting about this text was for someone who hated, who didn't like the notion of the self, Michaud had quite a developed persona in his writing that is um, skeptical, <clears throat> sort of arch, relieved by humor a lot of the time. Um, and what happens in 400 Men in the Cross is that persona gets dropped. And I hadn't seen that anywhere else in any, any of the other uh, of his other works. Um, and it happens right here. United with him, surrounded by images of him on the cross, finding all meaningful life in him, through him, with him, in preference to all other beings on earth. But that was long ago. That was in the serious years of my life, in my adolescence. That's really kind of gorgeous part of the book. Um, according to Raymond Bellor, who uh, he writes the a long afterward in the, the Gallimard edition of the collected um, show in, in French, he sees this book, 400 Men on the Cross, as being a, a preparation of the human body for the masculine experience, that Michaud is cleansing the body and readying it for what's to come next. Okay, so we can now leave 400 Men on the Cross and go to Watchtowers on Targets. This was a collaboration that Michaud did with the surrealist um, artist, Roberto Mata, Chilean. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with him. This book was originally 68 pages. There were eight etchings and aquatents by Roberto Mata, uh, uh, printed in only an edition of 99 copies. It was bound in a wood case uh, with the etchings and poems placed inside on cover card stock. It was an unusually large size. It was 13 and then eight of an inch by 10 and a quarter of an inch. So we start to see Michaud experimenting with the materials of the book, as well as with you know the correspondence with, between writing and painting. Vigi Sociabai was published in 1959, two years after turbulent, The Turbulent Infinite and Miserable Miracle. Mata and Michaud set up the following rules for their collaboration. For the first two sections, Michaud would respond to Mata's etchings. In the final third section, Mata would respond to Michaud. The book is wild and fast. It's unrevised, unedited, probably to, res to preserve the sense of collaboration that was occurring. Um, and we don't see the usual narrative links that we see with Michaud, um, however tentative. Plots will start and stop. Characters will appear suddenly and speak and then disappear again. But what is central to the book is the unusual stance of perspective and the title, Watchtowers on Targets. You, there's, an, there's an eye and then from the human eyes there, a, a watchtower sprouts 
and on top of the watchtower is an observation post, and in the observation post is an observer that is looking back. So the whole question of subjectivity, objectivity, gets turned around. Um, the whole question, the whole idea of watching or seeing turns back on itself. And if you can see, can you go back? Yeah, the 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 eyes at the top, the the green, and is you know you see the projecting uh, watchtower and the observation post, and also the kind of whirling dervish sort of energy that uh, Mata brings into this collaboration. Okay, you can go to the next one. This is another etching aqua tint by Mata. And the next one, I wanted to show you this one because there are four observers that are playing cards at a card table. And um, each of the observers has a sense of, of uh, consciousness, you know, happening for each of them individually, while at the same time they're extremely intent on the, on the, the card game and the, the card table, there are these also these sorts of cards that are behind them. Then at the bottom you get these rather licentious looking um, penis scrotum sorts of drawings that are matched with in some of uh, Michaud's writing in this book. There's uh, some of this appears as well. And if we go to the next slide, he writes this Michaud writes the only epistolary work that he was to ever do in this book, and it was called Correspondences, and there were cards. And he's playing with the notion of a postcard, which of course has a visual and a verbal aspect to it, and the idea of it being sent and then returning. Um, I'll just read the uh, kind of the middle of the last part there. Um, at the moment, we are with the Davos, shoulder to shoulder. From there, we are going to see the Tarasas, the Tarasas from Blue Bios. Always equal, always brothers. We exchange wheels. Next are the Priestess from Opresus. That's a necessity. And the tribe from Abrasius will be taken. Always equal, always up to standard. Afterwards, it's different. After, heads will be able to change. In the meantime, we have to put some of our oil on it, you understand? Don't reply with a tune. Reply frankly. I haven't come here to milk the papayas. Okay, so... Anyway, the, the entire book, because it's in this wooden case, the, the, the writing, but the writing and the edges are sort of slapped down like cards. There's that thing happening uh, within the, ma the material aspect of the book as well. Okay. Uh, it was unknown whether or not it was Michaud or Mata who created the title, but um, Mata had this to say about... Um, he, Mata dies 18 years after Michaud, and he apparently... Uh, after the collaboration and after Michaud's death, still had the sensation of a lot of Michaud's writing flying around in his head still. He still felt very close to it. So Malte explained, quote, Death interrupted me. I was counting so much on his presence, on the watchman. He was vigilant against my enthusiasm that could be a little too spontaneous at times. He restrained me, and that was friendship. Now I am an orphan of this vigilance and I am becoming a target exposed to everything. Okay, so we can move forward. This is the last text, Peace in the Breaking, um, which is the most mescaline of the mescaline texts. It is uh, very much about a particular mescaline experience that Michaud has in many ways it's um, a sort of partner to Miserable Miracle, if you know that book. If Michel could have had his way, he would have liked for this book to appear as an endless scroll to mimic the, the sort of rush of the drug experience. But what he settled for instead was 
Um, the book was published um, with the binding on the, on the top, like sort of like a legal pad. And what would and if you look really close, I don't I don't know if it renders in the PowerPoint, but you can imagine it. The um, the the cover is is curled back at the very you can see it at the very 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 top there. And um, okay, Chris, if you go to the next, and the the book at the beginning of the book there are fourteen of these uh, masculine drawings which are seismographic and spinal and Michel very much wanted the sense that you would see like you know a drawing and a drawing and a drawing and a drawing and then um, if you go to the next slide Chris please yeah. in, um, the poem piece in the breaking is also written in this uh, seismographic spinal form and so um, we can imagine that. Can you go backwards to the very one? If you notice, you can. It looks like there's handwriting buried underneath the the drawing. Do you see that? And then go to the one right after there. And this one in particular, you can see the handwriting and of course the spine. And what happens um, with these fourteen drawings? The, they, the, the 14 drawings get bigger and wider until they no longer form anything but a dust of signs with the last page containing only the small beats of wings um, without birds. <coughs> um, so, to conclude, I'm going to read, uh, I'm not going to read the entirety of Peace in the Breaking, the poem, because it is an 11 page poem. And I think we might all just sort of expire if I did that. So I'll, I'll, I'll read half of it. I found a, a nice breaking point for it. And before I do that, I wanted to say that um, in the rest of Michaud's oeuvre, we see, feel, or hear a kind of rhythmic pattern of ascension and descension. Ascension and descension over and over and over again. In, in this book, it's the only poem in his entire work in which the rational and the irrational mind unite into pure ascension. So the poem is like this beautiful um, aria, um, and Michaud invites us to enter his vision of, he called it a, a nervous projection screen. So it's kind of cool that we've got a screen before us, because that's what he was experiencing in this particular masculine experience, was a nervous projection screen or a vibratile carpet was another way he phrased it over which images and visual words passed. So if we view 400 men on the cross as a preparation of the body for the masculine experiments, then in Peace and the Breaking we see me show with the assistance of masculine freeing himself from the unwielding body.